Could you hear the recording in progress? Yeah, and I had to grant permission to continue. Mm -hmm. Ah. Okay, There's two, two more people. people. Two okay. more people, so admit. Why am I having trouble? Oh, there's more. Do we have any more in waiting room or have we got everyone in? I think we've got everybody in that's in the waiting room. Yeah, and, oh. and I, I have muted the, our two uh, members of the audience and just to let you know that we are recording this. Oops. All right, I got to get rid of that screen. So are we ready to get started? And we'll add more as- All as, right, let's hit it. In. Okay. So uh, we are here tonight to talk about seed saving. Um, I am uh, Leah Beck. I'm a master gardener with King County University of Illinois Extension, joined by Sue. So you Hi, might I'm Sue Steyer, another Sue master Steyer. gardener. And uh, we tend to, through the Kane County um, Master Gardeners Program, we talk about seed saving um, to different groups. We both save seeds. Uh, we're both somewhat novice seed savers and we do it for home gardening purposes. So um, we're gonna talk about some of the important things you should know if, you, if you're getting started into seed saving. And some of the, we're gonna go over easy ways to start, things that are easy to begin with, and then a little bit more complicated things that you might want to stay away from. So um, just curious if, um, you know, think about if you save seeds, if you want to add something in the chat, you can do that um, if you save your seeds. But, um, you know, there's lots of reasons uh, to save seeds. And if you save seeds, I'm curious, why do you save seeds? Um, you know, there's a lot of reasons we would save seeds. Um, you know, none, I mean, obviously for financial reasons, but it's a community. It's, uh, a, you know, seeds are heritage. They connect us to our cultures, to our histories, to our past and to our places. And, um, you know, that's one of the reasons I uh, save seed is because it's connections to community and to cultures. And I like it, having the diversity in seeds that you can get that you can't find in your, a seed house and you know just your everyday seed houses. Um, I also like to save seeds because um, you you have a broader range of things that you can grow, so then you have more flavor options. Um, but it also um, the seed I feel gets stronger, and it does get stronger as it gets more adapted to my location. So when I grow seed in my garden, and year after year, if I save that seed. At, you know, over time, it's going to continue to be more adapted to my environment, my climate, my growing conditions, and that's going to make the seed that much stronger and the plant that much stronger. So um, that's another reason, you know, it's just a lot makes it more, uh, the vitality of the seed is just much stronger when you do that. So Sue, so you want to move ahead there? So we're going to talk about um, seeds tonight, how do you select your plants, what you have to do for distancing, uh, isolation, harvesting. You know, as you see this outline, you know, primarily our focus is going to be on vegetables uh, with some talk about some flowers, primarily with some native flowers, but our main focus is going to be on saving vegetable seeds. While, although while we're talking about vegetable seeds, a lot of the techniques and the things that you need to know about seed saving they transcend whether you're saving vegetables, whether you're saving flowers, whether you're saving herbs, you know, different things that you're, you probably want to seed save for um, the techniques and the, and the, the main um, things that you need to be aware of transcend. It's the same whether you're doing veggies or not. Okay, so you see in that outline, it starts off with definitions. So that's what I'm going to talk about. So one thing uh, is the difference between pollination and fertilization. So pollination is just merely the transfer of pollen from the male part of the flower to the female part. So it's like, well, why do I need to know this? Because a lot of times you may be pollinating some plant and you'll think, well, I pollinated it, no problem, I'm gonna get seeds from it. And there may be a problem because fertilization has to take place. 
So that's when the reproductive cells join, as you most likely know. So one thing that's confusing for people is they think, well, this pollination, well, pollination can happen between anything if pollen gets on from one, even one tree to a vegetable, that's, that nothing's going to happen. But fertilization has to happen within the same species. So you have to know what species you're dealing with. Do I have one species? Do I have two? And a lot of people confuse and say, well, I think squash crosses with cucumber. Well, it doesn't because those are two different species. So we, we sometimes need to know a little more about pollination in our garden because about 75 to 95% of pollination requires uh, a pollinator. So uh, that would be an animal, most likely an insect for, for to transfer that pollen. Uh, wind and gravity are also means for transferring pollen, but mainly it's through a pollinator. So just know that not every time the pollination happens, you're, you're going to get a seed because fertilization is going to have to happen. So now let's look at the type of plant pollination. So the easiest plants to deal with are what we call a self-pollinated plant. So those would be a flower that has both a male and female part within the same flower and the pollen can move within that flower from the male part to the female part. And so examples of that are beans, tomatoes, lettuce. Those are, are pretty simple for seed saving and for keeping your species uh, and variety of species clean so that there's not any kind of mixing between varieties. Um, the ones that are harder to deal with that you will have to uh, hand pollinate and exclude, and Leah will talk about that, are going to be plants that either need, they might, might have flowers that are uh, have all the male and female parts, but the same flower can't pollinate itself. A different flower on the same plant is going to have to do the pollination. And it gets even more complicated when you have separate male and female flowers on the same plant. And the squash group that includes melons and cucumbers are, are an example of that. And then even more complicated is when the male and female flowers are on different plants. And those would be examples in the vegetable garden of spinach and asparagus and you probably know of ginkgos when everybody says, don't get a female ginkgo because you're going to get seeds and it's fruit and it's going to be smelly. So in the chat box, we've put some information on um, some of these plant families for you so that uh, you can learn more about them so that you're not going to be struggling with them as um, <clears throat> we have done in the past. So here's, here's an example in the squash family about uh, cross-pollination. So the cucurbits, which is the squash, melon, and cucumber family, what you have is the separate male and female flowers. So in the left slide, this is a male flower. It has this long slender stem on the flower. And then this is the female flower kind of hidden behind this leaf stem the female flower will have a little swelling on the bottom. <clears throat> Here's a better, <clears throat> excuse me, example of that. That's the ovary, which is where the fertilization takes place and where the seeds will form. So you need to know this in order for you to be able to do that um, if you're going to cross pollinate that group. Another confusing group and why we need to know plant names are the uh, broccoli cabbage family. So you look at these and you say, well, what do these all have in common? Well, they're actually all the exact same species, which means they can all cross with each other. They're just different varieties within the same species. So uh, you've got Brussels sprouts, you've got kohlrabi, you've got um, what? kale, you've got cabbage, you've got collards, um, you've got cauliflower, they're all the same. And I think there's a broccoli I can't see behind the 
panel. So they're all the same. It's kind of like, uh, you know how dogs, they're all dogs, but there's different varieties and they can all cross with each other. It's the same with some plant groups. So this is in the, the broccoli cabbage family and in the squash family. Uh, so we did put some information about those families uh, in the chat box. So right now, are there any questions about why you need to know the families or anything about pollination? You can put your question in the chat box or you could unmute yourself and ask it. Are there any coming up, Leah, in the chat box? No, I don't see anything. All right, so we'll move ahead. And this is, Leah's going to tell you a story that involves plant names. So, Sue, um, uh, Mark, you don't see any postings in the chat. I don't know if you can scroll up to the top of the chat. And if you don't see them, um, we'll uh, make them available again, but we can recopy those and paste them in. So. Um, so uh, Sue was talking about plant varieties and species. And so this is photos from my garden that you hear, see here. And these are um, an example I just had this year. And I have been seed saving um, for um, a few years and I still learn something new every single year. So I grow uh, two varieties of kale. I grow on the left is what I commonly is called dino kale, but I think the real name is lacinato kale. And then on the right, I also grow a red Russian kale. Now, uh, kale is a plant that is a biennial, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit later, but it won't put out seed until its second year. So this is my second year. I harvested from these kales in the summer of 2020. I overwintered them and I'm letting them go to seed this year because I want all this kale seed. So, um, and, and it's flowering now, um, you can see in this photo, actually, since I've taken this photo, they've turned into pods, but I was kind of worried when the flowers started happening and I thought I had to isolate these plants because I thought they'd cry, cross pollinate. And I was going to use containment, which we're gonna talk about that in a bit, but containment is when I would put some kind of protection over the plant so that the pollen from the dino kale would not cross with the pollen from the red Russian kale. So that, cause they were two, you know, they were in the same plant family. I assumed they were of the same plant species and that they would cross. So I was planning to have to contain these. And um, I was talking to Sue about this as we were preparing for this presentation tonight. And I said, oh yeah, I gotta uh, do some containment. I'll take a picture of my containment and my kale and we can include that in the presentation. And then, you know, we got to talking and then Sue made me doubt myself and I'm glad she did. <laughs> And I went and checked it in at Seed Savers, uh, or Seed, um, Savers Alliance. And there's also a link for that in the chat for that organization um, that will show you how it is. But these two types of kales, even though they're both kales, they're different species. One is of the species, the Brassica olarosa. I don't know how to say that. And the, and the other, which is similar to the cabbage species. And then the red Russian kale is in the Napus species, which is similar to rutabaga. So the end of the story on my kale is that I don't have to contain these. I don't have to protect either one of these kales from each other. They can coexist in my garden. They're about five feet apart from each other. They can flower. And I don't have to worry that the seed that I'm going to get from that is going to be a cross, which if it would cross, it would be not true to what it was. I'd get somewhere a kale if it, you know, if there was a cross pollination that um, couldn't happen, I would get some kind of a blend of these two kales. It wouldn't be um, authentic to the original variety that it was. So just a kind of a word, to, you know, of advice to, you know, check and see. And these resources are pretty readily available for you on some of the links through Seed Savers Exchange or Seed Savers Alliance. You can find out what plants um, are in the same species and what aren't for those that are going to cross. So there's some uh, resources out there for you on that. So um, we we'll move ahead, Sue. Is there a question in the chat? I see. Uh, okay, I think we're good. Mark, you saw the links. That's good. Um, so, um, so when you're selecting seed, there's some things that you want to know. And the most important things 
you need to know are highlighted in bold. So there's three types of seeds you can potentially have, open pollinated, heirloom, or hybrid. The thing that you want to keep in mind is that open pollinated seed and heirloom are the most important for seed saving, particularly open pollinated. So open pollinated means that you're going to get predictable results. Um, the, the, the children of the, the seeds are going to look like the parents. So the history is going to be passed through on the open pollinated. Heirloom seeds, these are seeds that have been preserved for 50 or more years, and it's a classification. So all heirlooms are open pollinated, but not all open pollinated are heirlooms. So it's kind of a technical thing, but if you see a seed that's labeled and marked on the seed pack as open pollinated or heirloom, you're safe to save those seeds. And by safe, I mean, I don't mean it's unsafe to save hybrids, but like you're, you can expect that you're going to get predictable results from that seed, that when you go to grow it out year two or three or four, whenever you're going to use that seed, you're getting plants that are going to look like the original plants. Unlike a hybrid, which hybrids are controlled crossings and uh, they're genetically different parents. So hybrid seeds will not produce seeds that are true to their parent or true to type. Um, you can save the seed on these. It's not that the seed won't be viable seed. It, it's likely that it would be viable, but hybrids are crosses between two different plants and they're selectively chosen plants for different characteristics. That's what they've done when they've bred them. Um, and so when you save that seed and you have like the children from the parent plant, the, the children, you know, one characteristic or trait might come through more dominant on the seed that you've saved. And you will know a hybrid seed on a seed pack when you're shopping for seed, because on the front of the seed pack, it will say either hybrid or F, F is in Frank, F1. That's how they classify seed. So for seed saving, seed saving purposes, I would focus on open pollinated or heirloom plants only. So um, annual plants, and if you're just getting started in seed saving, this is a, a, a really nice uh, starting point to save seed, is from annual plants. Annual plants mean that they set their flower in the first year in one year. So uh, think of things such as like tomatoes, things of beans, things of like lettuce, basil, cilantro, dill, and from a flowering, you know, you've got zinnias and marigolds, sunflowers, everything, the, the whole entire plant cycle is done in one year. So you can collect seed that year. So that's, you know, that's nice seed to say from generally, they don't, they're self-pollinating. Generally, they don't cross-pollinate. So they're, these are like easy seeds to start with. Now, unlike a biennial, we can go to the next slide, Sue. So the kale that I showed you uh, a picture of is a biennial. And again, that meant I grew it to harvest the leaves and eat in 2020. And this year I, I overwintered it. So I you know, made sure that it was protected through the winter um, you know, the, the dino kale particularly is not as tolerant as the red Russian kale to cold weather. So I potted that up and put it in my cold frame and kept it there all winter um, and then put it out in my garden this spring. And it's completing its life cycle in year two. And I know it's completing its life cycle in year two because it flowers in the second year. So, um, so if you want to save seeds from those types of plants, you know, um, they can be a little bit more challenging, particularly if you have to overwinter them and do some kind of protection of the plant through the winter. And you, uh, you know, you have to, um, another thing it does is you have to allow real estate in your garden to give it space to just, you know, put out for seed. So I've got these things in my garden, they're taking up some space that I could be growing other stuff in. Um, and it's, it's, you know, putting and growing it for seed. So examples of some of these are beets, kale, cauliflower, um, onions. I save my onion seeds from year to year um, and they overwinter well. Onions do really well in our climate. So I don't have to protect them much. I can just leave some onions in my garden. I let them go to seed and then I have seed that I use for the next year. So those are biennials. And then perennials are um, plants that um, have three or more growing seasons. 
And when I think of perennials, I don't often think of vegetables because in our zone, in our area, zone five, we really don't have a lot of perennial vegetables. You know, we don't have artichokes. Artichokes are perennial in zones that they're hardy to, but the only really, you know, I think a common vegetable that we have in our zone that's a perennial um, is asparagus. So um, I think of perennials as things more like maybe your native plants. If you have milkweed or if you have purple cone flower, um, you know, those are plants that set flower every single year and uh, they, they have a life of more than three years. So, um, you know, thinking about the plants that you want to save seed, we talked about make sure you get open pollinated or heirloom seed to have the most stable and predictable results. And you wanna, you know, be cognizant of the cross pollination between different varieties. So we put a link in the chat um, for squashes for an example. So summer squashes, pumpkins, gourds, they're all cucurbita squashes, as well as like a butternut squash, a, delic a delicata, I think, is a pepo in the um, pepo family as well. So if you're growing summer squash and pumpkins and you have these two plants and you want to save seed from your summer squash or your pumpkin, because they're all in the cucurbita pepo species, family and species, you're going to have to, uh, they could cross pollinate. So if you let that happen, you could take characteristics of your summer squash, characteristics of your pumpkin, and when you had your seed, it's going to be some kind of a cross between those two plants. It's not going to be true to the parent. Um, if, though, for example, you're growing a uh, summer squash and a butternut squash, and I think butternut squash is in the cucurbita muschata, muschata family, um, those you don't have to protect from each other. They, they are not going to cross with each other, or if they do, it's not going to be harmful. So it's only within the species that you want to be, that you have to be concerned about. Okay. Do you have anything to add there, Sue, or? No. Okay. All right. So just be, um, be cognizant of that when you're saving seed. Um, and then, you know, you want to think about isolation. So. I had, um, can you go to the next slide, Sue? So I had uh, shown that picture of the kales that I had in my garden and that I was planning to contain those. So um, if you have cross-pollination, if you're gonna save seed from things that will cross-pollinate and things that aren't self-pollinating, like tomatoes, you don't have to um, focus too much on other than distance, that's okay. But if you're doing things that have to be protected, you can contain them either by distance, meaning some kind of space seen between the plants so that it's not likely that the uh, pollen will um, cross. Or time, you know, time by that will mean different plant at different times or through some kind of a containment. So distance is nice if you're doing some of the um, annuals that we talked about that are self-pollinating. So things like tomatoes or lettuce, if you just have, you know, for tomatoes, they're recommending a few uh, rows apart from each other, you'll be fine. Uh, you know, beans, they're suggesting maybe a couple hundred yards. Um, beets, they said it's a mile apart if you're going to save um, beet seed. Now, I have a uh, full disclosure. I am saving beet seed this year. Beet seed is a biennial, which meant I grew the majority of my crop last year and harvested but I saved a couple beets, overwintered them. I'm letting them go to seed this year and I'm gonna do it. So this is saying you have to have a mile of distance between other beets that are pollinating or flowering at the same time. So, you know, I live in town, I'm in St. Charles, I live in town. I have no idea who within a mile from me, if anybody is trying to save beets or, you know, Swiss chard or spinach right now. So, you know, it's possible that the beet seed that I am saving right now or growing right now and intend to save and grow out later this fall, if it's ready or next year, you know, it's possible that it could have got some pollen from, you know, something else, you know, that it would cross with because I can't control and I, there's no way I'm going to know, you know, and so for the home grower, it's very difficult for us to know, but for uh, commercial growers or, um, you know, larger scale growers, you know, they can 
they'll block out their whole um, acreage so that they can have protection by distance. Um, another way you can isolate is by the time that you let it go to flower. So if you stagger your planting times, for instance, for lettuce, maybe lettuce is something that um, it germinates quickly, it matures quickly, and it goes to flower quickly in the growing season. It's, you know, I planted um, lettuce in my garden this spring. I'm harvesting, but I can tell that it's probably going to be about a week or two. It's going to start putting up a stalk and start to flower. And I will probably be able to get seed from that by August. So, you know, um, while lettuce is self-pollinating, I don't really worry about it crossing. If I grow several different types of, of lettuce, maybe I don't want, maybe I only want to save one variety of, say, a butterhead type of lettuce and then only let that go to flower. And then maybe this fall or later in the season, I would let um, you know a green leaf go to seed so that they're not flowering at the same time. I use timing um, on an annual basis too. So generally I showed you the picture of my kale. I have two kales flowering, but in the past I've only let one type of kale flower each year. And the seed is viable for five years. So you know, so this year I might, you know, in the past, I'd say like maybe in 2019, I would save red Russian. In 2020, I would save the dino kale. In 2020, you know, I'd kind of stagger the years and not save the same type of seed every single year. So that's another way that you can control um, the cross pollination. And then another one is the physical barriers or the containment. And um, these are just different examples. The one on the far left is some Swiss is my garden. Um, and that was from last year from some Swiss shard that I thought I was being really bright. Again, another thing I learned working on this presentation, I um, contained it. I didn't want it to cross pollinate with anything else. And it's something that could cross pollinate if there's anything within a mile. So I put a, this uh, row cover and I put a barrier on it and I tied it all up so that the flower um, is not open and easy for insects to get to or for wind pollination. And I saved the seed and I thought I was so bright because, you know, this spring I had like a whole bunch of Swiss chard seed. I had like a little jar full of it. And I, you know, I thought, this is great. I got tons of seed. I'm just going to really, you know, knock it out of the park with my Swiss chard this year. And I planted my Swiss chard and nothing happened and nothing happened and nothing happened. So then I went to the resources that in some of the links that we showed you, and I realized that what happened was last year, my flowers, because I had them covered and contained, they never got pollinated. So the seed is not good seed. It didn't, it's not full seed. It's not, um, doesn't have everything it needs to be to be a viable seed. So uh, it was not a self-pollinating plant and I, I didn't have success with that. So, um, I guess my the moral of my story is always check the resources through like Seed Savers Alliance, which we have a link there to see if it's insect or wind pollinated or self pollinating. Um, so if it is self pollinating, though, you can use these types of protections. So um, as we've been talking, the easiest types of plants to save are from your, the annual plants. Um, you know, lettuce is really easy. Beans are fun. And, you know, the nice thing about beans are beans and peas are nice big seeds. They're not really hard to handle. Um, those are easy things to save seed from. Um, and they require, you know, little terms of isolation. So you don't have to distance much. You don't have to, you know, do any timing. You don't have to do um, any isol any containment of that. So we're going to talk um, about this outline right here for the balance of our presentation. But, you know, just one thing to think about when you're saving before we move on to this, you know, that, you know, we know we want open pollinated seed, but you also want to try to save seed from a couple of different plants. The more diversity you have in your seeds, um, you're, you're, you know, you're going to preserve more genetic diversity over time. And, you know, you're not going to be having a mono plant that is just you know, could be prone to something. Um, it, it, 
it's, you know, it, you have more diversity than if you save from several different plants. So for example, I like the Rutgers tomato a lot. That's kind of one of my favorites. Um, it is an heirloom seed and I've been saving my seed for several years and I grow like eight different types of Rutgers tomato plants. So every year I will take um, fruits from each of the eight different plants and I'll save some seed from each plant. So like I might have, you know, eight tomatoes that I save seeds from and I've taken one tomato from every plant and have that seed because I want more genetic diversity. I want to get different plants in there. Now, we're, I'm assuming that, that, you know, we're primarily talking about home gardening and this is for, you know, not for like a commercial purposes. Commercial seed growers absolutely have lots of diversity. You know, I have some diversity when I do my tomatoes, but when I do my kales, I only have a couple plants that I save. So, you know, I'm not always um, the best. It's not always like um, do what I do, don't, or do what I say, don't do what I do. Um, so uh, just, you know, be cognizant of that, that the more plants you have and the more diversity in your seeds, you're gonna preserve more genetic diversity. <clears throat> so can we move on, Sue? So when you're selecting your seeds, and this is the seeds to harvest, not the seeds to grow, um, you wanna harvest from your best plants. If you've had plants that maybe didn't look as strong or the fruit isn't as robust or the leaf had something, you know, try not to save that plant and use that plant as your host plant for the seed. Try to look for the healthiest that you can because you wanna select for strength and for good viable plants for the future. So you know, make sure you have no disease. Um, and then what characteristic is important to you? Do you wanna pick, if, you, if size is really important, then pick your biggest fruit, you know, or maybe uh, your first fruit. Maybe you wanna you know, select for the, 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 the fruit that was harvested earliest or with the latest or, you know, different characteristics you can kind of select. Consider the characteristics of that particular fruit that you're saving for. Okay. So when do you harvest? When do you harvest the seed? And it varies based on the different plants that you're growing. So um, harvest is and mature seed, eating seed, mature fruit might not mean edible fruit. <laughs> so for example, mature fruit for tomatoes you wanna save those seeds when the tomatoes are mature. So basically when you would eat the tomato, when it's ripe and ready to eat, that's considered mature seed. However, uh, it, so that's like kind of what we call it market quality. You know, that's when you would, would save it. Um, however, like bean seeds, when the bean seeds are mature, that's not when we really want to eat a snap bean or a, a green bean. Um, you harvest beans when the, when the fruit is all, when the bean pot is all dried up, you know, that's the best time to harvest that. Um, cucumbers and eggplants are other examples. You don't, the, the seed is mature basically when the, the fruit is almost rotten. I mean, it's not edible at that point in time um, when you harvest um, um, cucumbers and eggplants. So which here's, you know, mature fruit looks different um, it's a, uh, on the top we have beans, you know, they're all brown and, and dried up, um, and, but that's the right time for seed. On the bottom is an example of cucumbers that are mature for seed, but you can tell that's not, you know, that's past edible quality. Um, that is, but that's when the seeds mature. And peppers, um, tomatoes, melons, you know, those are when they're edible, when you would eat them unless you eat like green tomatoes. And if you like green tomatoes, don't save those seeds, let them ripen. Um, so mature fruit, what does it look like? On the left is uh, an example of lettuce. It's a photo of lettuce that's gone to seed. And you'll see that the flower heads, kind of in the background, you can see those little yellow things. Those are the flower heads that look like they're starting to dry up. And then in the foreground of the fuzzy stuff, that is the flower that's like dried up. And if you take that and you um, gently kind of um, dismember the flower head, you will see in your hand and be loaded with lettuce seeds. 
I save lettuce seeds. I save all my lettuce seeds and I have so much lettuce seed. It's, it's insane how much lettuce seed you can get from just a handful of plants that I have, but I never had a shortage for, for lettuce seeds. So, um, and on the right, you know, for squashes, um, you want your fruits to be um, left on the vine. You want them to be good and cured. And it's, you know, really ideal that you even let your plants be in storage for a couple months before the seed is totally mature. So again, depending on what you're trying to save seed from, you know, look to see when is the right harvest time because it can vary based on the, the different plants. So when you're harvesting your seed, you're going to want to uh, clean it and we don't clean it with water. You wanna keep the, your seed dry once you harvest it. You know, that's kind of the most important thing. You know, don't, you wanna get it, you know, not keep it in a damp area or a moist area. If the beans, for example, aren't completely dry, I've left those in my garage during the hot, you know, in the hot weather of September that we have and let them dry or I'll put them, I have a screen porch. I might throw them in my screen porch where they don't get wet, but they get a lot of airflow to help dry them out. Um, you wanna make sure everything's dry. Now you can, um, um, you know, separate your, your seeds from your shaft. So all the, the, like the shaft is like the remnants of the flower head that might be in with, or the, or the bean pod that might be in with your seed. Um, you know, if you can try to get as much of that shaft out of there, you can use screens, um, you can shake them, you can put your, run your seed in front of a fan if it's a heavy seed like bean. Um, but, you know, try to clean it up a little bit um, so that it's, you're not storing a bunch of shaft. If your seed isn't completely dry, um, can you go to the next slide, Sue? If your seed isn't completely dry, um, you can, you know, set up a screening method to dry it. Um, I put, like I said, I don't have anything this sophisticated. I just put mine on some newspaper in my screened in porch, which gets a lot of airflow. And, you know, if the seeds aren't completely dry, they dry, you know, nicely in my, in my porch. Um, so you just want your seed, you know, you just want to make sure it's dry. You don't want any moisture. Um, to get any kind of mold or anything in your seed when you're storing it. Um, so it's a little different process for things that are wet, such as your squash seeds, or if you're saving cucumber seeds, um, tomato seeds, pepper seeds. Um, on my, pep I, my tomato seeds, I ferment, which this, these photos show fermenting seed. Sue, I think you've saved seed and you don't ferment your tomato seeds. No, so I just... I just put them on paper towels and let them dry. Yeah. So, you know, there's, it's, um, you know, the, they tell us that the fermentation, like, you know, helps uh, keep it more viable and keep out some kind of, uh, is it, what is it, Sue? I don't even know why we're I supposed think to. They, they said a seed coat. There's something on the seed coat that you want to get rid of and fermenting gets rid of it. I think if you're going to plan to store for a long period of time, the fermenting is the way to go, but I store just year to year. So you just put your, your tomato seed in a jar and I, I leave it on my counter for a couple of days. And when it starts to get like fermented, uh, you know, and I can tell because it's, you know, they kind of get uh, the, the viable seed sink and the, the you get pulp on it. Um, I just, take off the seed, skim off the seed onto a newspaper and let it dry for however long it needs to dry. And then I store my seed. Um, my things like um, pepper seeds though, I don't ferment my pepper seeds. I don't do that. I just, when I get my peppers out, I just lay them on newspaper till they're good and dry. And then I package them up. So next slide. So Sue's gonna take over on storing seeds. Okay, so I have right here, this is, how I store my seeds in a jar. There's a paper bag. This is corn seed that I harvested a couple of years ago in a paper bag within a jar with a good seal. So that's what this slide is telling you. Cool and dry, uh, dry, especially dry, uh, in paper, glass jars. Oh, and you know those little absorbent things that you get when you buy shoes or whatever? I save every one of them and put them in the jar with my seeds. So I have many jars with seeds. 
So that keeps pests away. Uh, yeah, I label, not, not like it's telling you to do here, but I know what's what. And so you find your own system for that. So let's do a little more detail. So again, here's pictures of jars and there's some of my jars. The worst thing is really moisture. That's, I mean, temperature is bad, but uh, moisture is, is probably the worst. I mean, so what you, that's why Lee has emphasized dry seed. Make sure your seed is dry. And then when it's dry, put it in a jar. Don't put it in a humid place where with a, in an unsealed jar where moisture can get in and you know gets wet and then it dries and wet and dries. You just lose your, your seed life. The same with temperature. Temperature extremes are really bad. Um, don't store seeds in a garage. That's the worst uh, because it gets really hot in there, really cold, so you get a lot of swings in, in temperature. Uh, I think we both store ours in basements, right? Do you store do. Any, any in a refrigerator? I don't. My basement's almost like a refrigerator in the right. winter, though. Yeah. And and the basement, you know, my basement's pretty steady with the temperature. So, yeah, a lot of people ask, you know, do I need to store it in a refrigerator? And really, a refrigerator is only necessary if you're going to store for many years. Um I uh, got some seed from someone a couple of years back that was 25 years old. It was tomato seed and it was still about 80% viable. And, and I'll talk about how that, how you tell that in a minute. So for long-term storage, you're going to want to, to use a refrigerator, but if you're just going to use your seed up in a few years and collect more seed, uh, that's, that's an unnecessary step. And so we, uh, we, you want to keep the insects out and the old desiccant packet. Those are great to use. So this is a good, good thing about uh, knowing. And there are many uh, charts. You can look at uh, university extension. You can Google that and you can find charts from many different uh, states. This, this gives you just a general idea. Small seed means small lifetime. So it's onion, parsley, um, uh, celery root and celery, they don't store very well. Uh, I've had more success than one year with corn. And Leah, do you even bother to store lettuce or do you just get it every year? Oh, I do because, you know, I'm always, um... Thinking, I, I usually use two to three year old lettuce seed because I'm always like, well, I'll save my newest in case something happens. You know, I, I never want to use my newest. So I, um, I use my lettuce seed well beyond the one year. But again, what happens is it, it's viability decreases and I have so much seed, I overseed. So I might, yeah. plant, I might really need, you know, 20 plants, but I might plant, plant 50 seeds and because I can't, because I have it because I have so yeah. much seed. Yeah. So, that, and that's the same, you know, like if a lot of times people will buy, this is a separate topic, lawn, you know, grass seed, it's the end of the season, oh, I'm going to grow, I'm going to buy this grass seed that's on sale. Grass is another notorious one that does not overwinter store very well, you'll, you'll lose a lot of viability. So how do you know whether you lost viability? You do a germination test. So here's a picture of a germination test. So what you do is you take, you know, when I've done them, I've only done like 10 seeds. This example has 20 seeds and a wet paper towel or coffee filter works well. And you just spread the seeds like they're shown here and you uh, roll it up. You can roll it up or fold it over and, and put it in a a bag or something that's going to keep the moisture. It doesn't need to have the sun though. It needs to be in a warm place for germination, especially if you're testing this in the winter. And starting, you know, if, depending on this, you look at whatever kind of seed you're, you're testing, when it says it takes like five days to germinate, in five days you start opening up and looking to see how many have germinated. 
and how many are it, not just germinating, but you want to also look at the, how healthy they are. So in this case, I counted um, 19 out of the 20 seeds were germinating fine. So that's 95% uh, viability. So that's pretty good. They, these look like, they look like, you know, I'm going to say tomato. I, I don't know, maybe they are, they're pepper, but what do you think, Leah? Yeah, they, one or the other. Yeah. So, Hard to tell. So that's, that's what you do if you're worried because you save your lettuce seed for three years and you know that it says it's only supposed to be really good for one year, you can do a little test and in a week you know, okay, this is my rate, so I'm going to have to double the amount of seeds I put in. So it's just a good trick to know. So the last thing that we're going to talk about is this dormancy requirement. And as far as I, I can't think of any vegetable seeds that require a dormancy period. This is more for um, uh, the native seeds, especially uh, because they grow, you know, your, your prairie plants are out there growing. They make seed at the end of the season and the seed sits there and it, it's outside and it's exposed to the elements, the cold, the moist. And that's exactly what it needs. If you go somewhere and you collect prairie seeds in September or October, if you want them, most many of them to grow the next year, you have to provide what nature normally provides for them. So there are various conditions. They may need just a cold, they may need a cold and wet, uh, they may need some what's called scarification, which is uh, taking a nail file or a knife and scraping on the seed. I, I did that with something this year uh, that I was growing. And, and some prairie plants may even need fire. So don't think you're going to go like, you. oh, I've always wanted pale purple coneflower and I'm going to just pull these seeds. I'm going to put them in my basement and then I'm going to plant them next year. Nothing's going to come up. So you need to know. I, and I will say that um, Prairie Moon Nursery online, they, they have um, the instructions. And when you look at them, depending, but they'll, they'll tell you when you buy a seed, this is code G or whatever. And they have 15 different dormancy requirements depending on the seed they tell you there's 15 different things that you can do you for depending on which seed you have you have one of those 15 things uh, I just I bought some wild leek seeds from them uh, and got them this spring and if I want to plant them well I do want to plant them before the end of this growing season they needed um, first they needed 30 days of warm, and then they now they're in 60 days of cold, and then I can put them in the ground at the end when that's done, and maybe it'll be in July and they can start growing. So the 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 word is just with with native plant seeds, uh, just to to know what you're dealing with. So this uh, gives you information uh, from University Extension on horticulture. So if you just Google that, uh, you can find all kinds of, of uh, information. Uh, Minnesota has a really good extension um, uh, program and a lot of their information is useful for Illinois. Uh, so that's another good one to check. I shouldn't say that, but I did. Okay, so uh, master gardeners are available for help. The help desk is open. So uh, that means you can email, you can phone, and you can even walk in now with a mask, I think. So thank you everybody and we'll take questions now. I'm going to stop sharing so sue uh rose has a question i'm gonna actually put a link on here i'm gonna find it um and i'll put the link for prairie oh moon nursery. yeah prairie prairie moon nursery there are um that one is probably the biggest 
it, it started in Rockford, Illinois, and then they moved to Wisconsin. That's probably the biggest of the prairie, the Midwest prairie nurseries. There's also one called Prairie Nursery that you can Google. Um, and there's a couple, there's Piso in uh, just south of here. It's about an hour south of here. That's another good prairie nursery. Um, I don't think they deal in seeds though, but Lee has been there to pick up plants and I've ordered plants from them. They will ship them as well. I'm gonna put a link to a, it's just, this is just to a particular seed that they sell the anise hyssop. But when you go down into the seed description, you'll see, um, I can't post that, but you'll see where it says germination code. Do you want me to do that? Here, let me, um, you want me to save my screen? Because I could, no, I'm um, gonna. All right, I'm I'm attempting to do a share screen here. There, can you see go that? Go to the chat. Can there you see you the the share screen now? Yeah, and if you if you scroll down. All right, I'm going to scroll down. So they've got about. They've got um, over to your right. Oh, all this! Code. Whoops, whoops! Let me get there. I gotta, I gotta close out the people. Okay, so germination code D or this. So here, cold moist stratification. So that this is telling you, you you get some damp sand or vermiculite, uh, and you put your seeds in there, and I use a plastic bag and put them in your fridge. So, and it says for the number of days in parentheses. So you got to put them in your fridge for 30 days in some moist sand. And then you'll get success. And then what's the D, Sue? D is that, oh, they need to be surface sown. So they need light to, to germinate. So isn't that like basil? Basil needs light to germinate as well, I think. Rose, I, um, Rose asked questions how you can um, see what the topics are to the links. Um, so at the very top, if you go to the top of your chat, there's a Seed Savers Exchange link. Just a, a little bit um, about Seed Savers Exchange and Seed Savers Alliance. They're both nonprofit organizations that are dedicated to seed preservation and they're all open pollinated seed and they have quite a broad um, and, and, and robust seed saving um, offering, but they also offer a lot of resources in terms of education because they're just, they're nonprofits and they're committed to, um, you know, preserving uh, the diversity of our seed. So there's a lot of resources. This particular link at the very top will give you a lot of details on terms of by the different plants, in terms of distancing, if it's self-pollinated, if it's wind pollinated, if it's, you know, how it pollinates, about how distance, whether they're biennials, perennials. So a lot of the things we talked about, you'll find on this PDF link. Um, and then there's other, wait, the wait, other wait, links wait, are wait. about- You keep saying there's something in the chat with these links, but I cannot see anything out in the chat other than where I'm typing a question. I don't know what links you're talking can about. You, is there over to the right of your chat screen? Can you go all the way to the top? Can is you grab like the scroll thing here? What I'll do, let me see if I can, I'll just copy this from here. Or show me your screen where you see it. Cause I don't Here, see I'm going to put it right now on the, it, I'm down at the bottom. Okay. Uh, did I get it? Do you see that? That I just put in at the bottom of the chat box? Can you no. see it? Seed Savers Exchange? No. Could you show me your screen and show me where you, you, you see this? Um, I don't know if I can share that. I'm already, let me, let me oh. make a document really quick. Hold on. I'll share this in a minute. Okay, now let me go back to this. Let me share my screen and let me put this. Okay, so can you see, you can see this now. Yeah, Seed I, Savers yeah. Exchange. If you just Google Seed Savers Exchange, 
you'll get their their home page and then the same with seed savers alliance uh if you google that when you get to there you'll be able to find cabbage species and squash and so seed savers exchange uh again with you can google and get for distance and then if you google um this was the P R A I R I Prairie Moon Nursery. If you Google that, you will um, you'll get to their main page and and you'll be able to see. Okay, thank you. They're now appearing on the on the chat. Oh, okay. Did I stop sharing? Yeah. Oh, good. I couldn't remember. Are there other questions? Well, I, if there are no more questions, uh, you're always welcome to call Master Gardeners or email. Uh, they will get you information about seed saving or any other uh, gardening question that you have. And uh, we enjoy answering questions about gardening. So thank you very much for, for attending and uh, get out there and save some seeds. There's, there's a question from Mark. Um, is oh. there a chance of a tomato variety cross pollinating? Uh, there is a chance. Um, tomatoes are self pollinating and they're also annual. So you have them in your first year. Self pollinating, if you remember in one of the early charts that Sue showed us that they don't, you know, they don't need insects to pollinate. They are self-pollinating, but that does not mean that an insect could not pollinate it. So it's possible that a tomato could cross. It's not likely, but it is possible. Right, a hungry, um, a hungry bee, if there's nothing else around uh, and a bee is hungry, they, they can force their way into tomatoes. And if they're visiting, you've got two different varieties, you're, you know, they could do it. But it's it's unlikely, but possible. I never worry about it. I don't worry about it either. And I have not. I've, I saved quite a bit of tomato seed, and I've never had any seeds that come through the next year year that aren't like predictable of what I was expecting. But it is possible. Um, but really, if you did want to isolate, I mean, even if you just kept some like a few rows apart in your, I mean, I don't know, you know, the size of your garden obviously it depends on how much space you have, but. If you could even plant them like, you know, say 10 feet apart in your garden, if you are worried about it, that would should be, you know, adequate distance. And that would be like, as we were talking about the isolation methods, tomatoes are very successful if you can just do some distance with them. But I like, like Sue, I don't worry about it. And I've never had a problem. So it's possible, not likely. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, again, we're, we're uh, always available. You can email your master gardeners a question day or night and it will get answered. So thank you everyone for attending and have a good rest of your night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.